It is my uh, honorable duty to introduce the speaker today. Everybody is welcome. Uh, I first heard of Karima de Prasito from Tudor Zanfires long ago. He said that uh, he had an extraordinary student, undergraduate student, who proved two long standing open problems in convex geometry. And, um, and uh, uh, indeed, he did prove two nice conjectures, uh, neat conjectures in convex geometry. He remained close to geometry and convex geometry and combinatorics ever since, but he uses more topology and algebra and algebraic geometry. For instance, uh, the hard left shed theorem and the, and the watch theory is used by him directly in combinatorics. Um, and, uh, and he is able to conjecture and prove, and whatever he touch, touches, he is able to prove something about it. Um, uh, I was asked a, a couple of times to write a letter of recommendation for him to various universities. I, don't, I will not name them. And I wrote a very short letter saying that he is an extraordinarily talented uh, and hardworking young mathematician, and every department should be happy to have him. And some places that was sufficient, that some places they needed more information. So here is for you, Karima de Prasito, for the AM, AMS, EMS Prize Lecture. Karim, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, I mean, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. So I first have to apologize. Um, I mean, uh, Imre said very nice things about my ability to solve problems. Um, unfortunately, um, my my tablet broke uh, on the way, so this I was not able to solve. So the talk would, was supposed to contain some parts that are right onto the slides. Um, it doesn't work. Um, I will try to to, to compensate by by speaking about it. Um, so. Um, what I want to talk about is essentially the um, um, some of some very cool applications of, of left shed theory, which is something coming from algebraic geometry. It is a, it's a, a field of, of theorems. It's a collection of theorems from algebraic geometry to combinatorics. But the way that we will tackle this in the end is that it will turn out that the, uh, the methods from algebraic geometry or the theorems from algebraic geometry that we have will not be enough. So what we have to do is actually first reduce the problem to an algebraic geometry problem. And then it turns out that we actually have to use in the end again combinatorics to, to solve the algebraic geometry, uh, the, 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 prob the algebraic po geometry problem that we reduce it to. And this is uh, the topic of the talk. And here's uh, the, the, the very innocent start. Um, so you draw a graph into the plane, all right? Somehow you can, you can think of uh, this as cities and roads connecting them. So two, 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 uh, two cities, um, are not connected by more than one road. That's kind of a basic rule, and no, no city is 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 connected to itself. And I mean, you don't want to to create uh, collisions, so no two roads should cross. All right. So given B cities, uh, B locations, how many roads can you draw? And the the answer to that is classical. All right. I mean, the, I mean, uh, that's not quite the, the the precise. I mean, you can improve this bound a, bit, a little bit by an additive error, but that's essentially it. So the number of roads e by e for edges is at most three times v, where v is the number of vertices. So in other words, what I'm saying here is a planar graph, right? That has no double edges and no loops, does not have too many cannot have too many edges. Exactly, it's a more, at most linear one. Um, now you can ask yourself, right? What is what is the first what is the first thing that you can ask yourself in any talk? It's usually whether the same go the same goes to in higher dimensions. So I mean, okay, so we already I already said it in an abstract way, right? So we have graphs that we embed into the plane. 
All right, and okay, so what would be the first thing that could come to mind? Okay, graphs into higher dimensions, that's easy. You can always embed a graph in higher dimensional space. Um, so what we do instead um, is, well, okay, so we have higher dimensional complexes, so, or combinatorialists sometimes talk about hypergraphs. So um, a hypergraph really is, um, is okay, so we, let's let, let, let's talk about some Fisher complexes the Fisher complex is really just a connection is a, it's a really just a connection of higher dimensional simplices such that every two simplices again which has a simplex or it's a down closed set of the power of of, of of the power set of some finite set that's it all right and now we can again ask well does this embed into uh Euclidean space all right, so you can ask a two-dimensional complex, does it embed into R3? And you already see that if you have, if you draw too many triangles, that won't work. So that's a good question. It turns out that the question into R3 is not the right one because essentially there are local obstructions and there are global obstructions. Uh, and essentially the problem in R3 return, I mean, you can reduce it to a planar one and then it's not so interesting. The first interesting case of this problem is embedding it into 2K space. So in, in this case, the K-dimensional complex into 2K space, or so two-dimensional complex into 4 space. Right? And then you expect that like in general position, if you have these things in general position, now I have to compensate for the lack of being able to draw. Uh, well, you expect that somehow the, the two-dimensional phases they intersect transversally. So they would intersect in points. Um, all right. So if they okay, so they, that's that's already good. So now how many how many can I expect? So it turns out that this question is rather hard. One of the reasons that it is hard is that in the plane, right? If I have a graph in the plane, then I can always add edges and edges and edges and edges until I am a triangulation, until every bounded face or until every face is essentially a triangle. And we can also have speak of it face at infinity to be a triangle. Um, so it, this is a monotone process. And then I only added edges. I did not affect the number of vertices. And now I can use just Euler formula. This is just why Euler was able to prove it. But in higher dimensional space, we cannot do that. We cannot just add triangles monotonically until, I mean, I mean there's no chance of getting a set relation of four spaces when. Uh, I mean, it's, um, there's not even a chance of getting a two skeleton of a set relation of four spaces. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, so. I, I will not be able to draw, so ask questions at any point in time. I don't actually know whether that's possible. Um, all right. So um, the answer, well, with the slight caveat, is that we now know that the, uh, the, the bound is indeed linear. So the number of k-dimensional faces of this complex is at most k plus 2 times the number of k-minus 1-dimensional faces. All right? So, I mean, this is, uh, OK. So. This is provided uh, the embedding is PL. So it's a piecewise linear map. So there's a slight uh, restriction on the top, I mean, on the, on, the, on, the, on the type of maps that are allowed. They cannot be too wild. Otherwise, uh, that's it. So for instance, a two-dimensional complex that embeds into R4 can only have um, four times as many, um, um, four times as many triangles as, it, as edges. That is it, right? It's a that's and if you think about it, that's a tight uh, the tight bound. I mean, you can you can actually just greedily um, start from from a simplex and add as many triangles as you can, and you will get this bound asymptotically. Um, okay, so I mean, I should say that the problem is 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 open if you if if the complex uh, is not simplicial, for instance. I don't know what happens then. Uh, I, I also don't know what happens if the map is nasty. All right. OK. Um, the light turned off. Sorry. Um, OK. So how do I solve this problem? Um, well, I mean, the title kind of advertises it. So I, these, prob these types of problems, in some way, should be should be affected by left shift theory. And this may be surprising because, I mean, the first thing that you would try to do um, um, is, is topological methods, right? That we have obstruction theory, 
I mean, this could be the first thing that you should try. Turns out that this is not good because obstruction theory measures something homological or measures something topological, but really we are looking for an invariant of the chain complex, all right? So the number of phases. So it doesn't work. We, if you lose topology, you get things that are orders of magnitude worse than this bound. So it turns out that the, 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 the right way to, to, deal, to deal with it is really algebraic geometry. So, um, Let's, let me give the simplest, the simplest form, the simplest situation. So um, associated to every simplicial polytope P, okay? Uh, with rational coordinates, we can look at um, the, 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 the smooth toric variety associated with it. I mean, it's not quite smooth, but that's fine. Um, and then we can look at the chow ring, but I mean, if you have never seen the chow ring, we don't actually need to talk about it. We can actually, define this directly. Um, we can look at the fan over this polytope and then look at the ring of Conway's, uh, uh, Conway's polynomial functions. And actually there's a, sorry, there's a, the, 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 fun, the continuous functions on this fan that are polynomial on each, uh, polynomial on each of the, of the, of the cones. All right, so now, um, they just have to fit together uh, at, at um, at the corners of the of, of each polyhedron in the fan, and I take out the the ideal generated by the global linear functions. All right, and this is one way of talking about it. Another way of talking about it is I take I think of this fan as a simplicial complex. Right, I'm a, I have a simplicial polytope. All the faces are simplicial, and I take the um, uh, polynomial ring, and then I mod out basically by every by everything that does not come. From uh, from the from 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 the combinatorics, as well as modding out this uh, ideal theta p, which is generated by the coordinates of the vertices. This corresponds to a, the idea generated by the global linear functions. All right, and then we have this turns out to be a, a very nice algebra. So it's a graded algebra, um, and it has a Poincaré dual. It has a Poincaré pairing. So the the degree D component, if I started with a D polytope, is, is isomorphic to R, to the reals, and um, I have a perfect pairing between degree I and degree D minus I. Okay, so I mean, that's, that's already a nice object. It's, it gets even nicer. Um, the nice thing about this object really is that it satisfies a, a very deep theorem, um, and actually it's more, it's, this is, I mean, this is a very special case of the hard lecture theorem, but this is somehow um, the, the one that is very accessible here. And it's very easy to state, right? So I have this, 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 this algebra, um, and I um, pick in this the class of a convex function. So what I, I take is, uh, well, I, I take a Conway's linear function that is convex on this fan, right? This is, this is a, a degree one function, right? It's a linear function, well, it's a Conway's linear function, and I multiply with it. And I multiply exactly those degrees that or I multiply exactly between those degrees that are isomorphic by Poincaré duality. And I get something stronger. I get that this multiplication actually induces an isomorphism. All right, so why is it stronger? Well, it means that if you look at the, the Betty numbers, all right, or for instance, look at the Betty numbers of, the, of, this, of this object, so you look at the the dimension of the graded components, so the dimension of the I graded component, I plus one graded component, then this form, then, then this is unimodal, right? And it goes up and then it goes down, right? This is not something true for, for any Poincaré duality algebra. For instance, if you just take the, the, the cohomology ring of a sphere, right? That's also Poincaré duality, but um, it is not, it does not satisfy this, this, this unimodality. So it, in particular, it cannot come from a left shift theorem because well, I mean, I have a one at the beginning and a one at the end, but nothing in between. Um, and it turns out um, that uh, for a general superficial homology sphere, um, that um, that uh, um, the, um, the 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 Poincaré duality property is still I mean, it's still valid so i mean you can you can if you have a general homology sphere you can 
not that does not come from the boundary of a polytope, right? You know, if you take the boundary of a polytope, you get a sphere naturally. But for every homology sphere, this is still a Poincare duality algebra. This is interesting. I mean, for an algebra, this is an is this immediately an interesting question. Um, and um, but for for um, for for for, um, for for combinatorials, it may be not so immediately apparent why we want to ask this. So we'll get to it in a second. But um, um, so immediately we can we can we can ask. Well, well, okay, we have a Poincaré duality algebra. What about the left shift here? And the class of spheres that is a more more general than homology spheres, triangular homologies, is a much much larger list. And if you just look at it asymptotically, it's much much more. So I mean, we have this problem that for the moment may only interest uh, uh, the algebraic geometer. And for the combinatorials, it might not be interesting to begin with. And this is, OK, so I mean, let's say, I mean, it's a very deep theorem. How would, how would I get to this? Well, first of all, I should get some motivation to actually, to actually prove this. Um, and for this, I have, to, um, I have to now wave my hands a little. Um, so what I'm saying is that the hard luxury theorem for spheres implies um, the um, um, implies the 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 the, the, the Grimbaum Pelai-Sakaria conjecture. So this bound that I talked about at the start. And um, so now I cannot draw. Um, so what I have to um, I have to I have to I have to wave my hand a little. So the idea here is, okay. So I have I have my algebra associated to the simplicial complex that I want to embed. There's a basic result saying that. If I have a simplicial complex that PL embeds into um, into R2D, so if I have a two-dimensional complex embedding into R4, uh, three-dimensional complex embedding into R6, in the PL way, then I can actually think of this uh, complex as a subcomplex of a triangulation of of R, of, uh, of R4, or better yet, of S4. I can compactify, right? And now of the of the four-dimensional sphere. Or more generally, about the two K dimensional sphere. Um, and now, okay, so what's what now? Now I want to get to um, this this original bound. So let me just say what's what happens here. So um, now the point is that um, if you think about it, this um, the, the 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 element of this ring A that I'm looking at, they are generated. By the monomial, by, by by the faces, right? For, so for every face, I have my own monomial that is that 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 I that I've generated in the ring. In particular, I have an inequality that says that the number of k faces um, is 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 um, right. Okay, so let me let me say for for instance in this way that the that the k component of this of this ring a a of delta, so a k of delta, um, is 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 bounded below by um, it's sorry bounded from the above by the number of k minus one dimensional faces I have, right? So I get a natural inequality be between the size of this ring and the number of faces, all right? And now it turns out that um, this inequality here that I want it turns out to just be the inequality saying that um, between in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a triangulation of a 2k dimensional sphere between the degree k component and the degree k, k plus 1 component of this ring, A, I want an inequality of the, of the dimension. So I want um, ak of delta to be larger as a vector space than ak plus 1 of delta. So, um, that is, okay, so, but what do I know? So if I look at this at Inside my inside my inside my intersection ring of, 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 of the larger sphere sigma, well then I have a subjection down from um, down from sigma to um, to delta. So I have this isomorphism between a, a k of sigma and a k of a k a k plus one of sigma. So what I want really is right. I want um, um, I want to be able to uh, Turn this this isomorphism on the level of sigma to uh, well I wanted to, to to turn it into a surjection on the level of delta. So I have a little commutative diagram between a k of sigma and a k plus one of sigma, and then going down to the um, components for delta. 
Um, and this means that, okay, so once I have this, um, I, I, um, um, I, get my, I get my inequality that I want. So this is the inequality that leads me to the grimm Kalai sakaria um, conjecture. So that's, 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 that's the story. I mean, this was now a little hand, hand wavy, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I will get back to it later. But so this means that we have to, we have to prove that uh, the, the Lefschetz theorem holds for ge more general objects than, um, than just, uh, than just uh, the, the case of polytopes. And now I will tell you the story how to get there. And along the way, I will tell you a little more of the corollary um, there, that, um, of, of, of the left shed here. So let me just go first beyond, if I go beyond the, to, to the first cases of, of the hard left shed theorem, this left shed property, beyond um, the, um, the, 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 the immediate case of, that is given to me by algebraic geometry, right? you know, this case of of smooth varieties, um, then the first case that I want to talk about here, um, and this is somewhat arbitrarily chosen, is the case of matroids. I mean, it's chosen because this is one of my, my earlier works, don't with, don't with Juni Ha and Eric Katz. Um, so again, there's a notion of matroids. Matroids generalize arrangements, right? And what I can do with an arrangement um, is I can compactify the complement of an arrangement in a nice way, and I can look at this as a variety, and I can look at this char ring again, and denoted by by a of this the, the char ring of, of of the arrangement will just again be not denoted by a, just a Latinian ring. I can do this again more generally for matrix, and now you will see the similarities. Um, so an example. Of, for, for a non-trivial matroid, um, um, well, I could just take, uh, I, I could just start uh, some with the with the with the nicest matroid, which is just a Boolean lattice, right? So I could, and now I, what I take is I take the polynomial ring generated by um, each of the subsets of the of of the ground set. So I will actually not take all of them, I just will take um, the proper ones. So not, I will not, not, not take a total set and I will not take the empty set. Okay, so now I have a, a polynomial ring. And now what I want to, um, I want to, to encode the Boolean lattice in this, in this, in this, in the, in the ring in the end. So what I do is I, I basically mod out um, everything that does not come from the lattice structure. So I basically, what I mod out is um, all the monomials that are not comparable. Okay, so I take out um, um, all the monomials that are not comparable. What I'm left with is just the lattice structure. So now I have everything that encodes an inclusion in this ring. Um, that's the first step. If I just do that, then I have an infinite dimensional object. And then I do something that's called the Atene reduction. Um, and I do it in a nice way in order to get, I mean, on the face of it, to get the finite dimensional object. Um, more complicatedly, what, I, what, this is, um, what this is about is um, that uh, what, I, what I now do is I want to, I want to get at this object um, of the Boolean lattice, but I don't want to di distinguish the atoms. So what I do is I basically say, okay, so there's a natural symmetry Right, I want to exchange every two of these of the elements of the ground set. I, I don't care which is which. So I, I model out some linear relations that basically encode just that. And that's it. So this is an algebra associated to my Boolean lattice. Um, and now this is this is my, my Boolean lattice. And now what I can do is I can take for any nice sub lattice of this Boolean lattice, I can take out all the elements, all the Subsets are not inside my inside my inside my lattice, right? I can also right, this will be some subset of the power set or some subset of the Boolean lattice. I take those out, right? I quotient out by those, and I get a smaller ring. And it turns out um, that this ring again is a Poincaré duality algebra that is not hard to show, and that it satisfies the hard left shed theorem and the Hodge-Riemann relations. Okay, so the Hodge-Riemann relations 
um, say something, the Hadlef Shadzium says something about this isomorphism between the degrees, and the, the, the Hodgkin relation says something about the signature of this, of this binding up point. All right, so what's the use of that? Well, um, one of the uses of that, of the Hodgkin relations in particular, is that what we get here is a um, nice statement about the characteristic polynomial of the matroid. So the characteristic polynomial um, of a matroid that is um, I, essentially you should think of it if you have never seen this before. Let's let me give you two intuitions. So if the matroid comes from an arrangement um, over the complex numbers, then you can look at the Betty numbers of the complement. All right. So this is this is one way, and because the Betty numbers are exactly the coefficients of this of this characteristic polynomial up to sine, but that doesn't matter. Now, an alternative way of thinking about this is if your matroid comes from a graph, so um, then the characteristic polynomial is really just the, the, the chromatic polynomial up to, a, up to some trivial factor. So the chromatic polynomial is just um, you count the number of colorings of your graph with n colors. And then, OK, so it turns out that this is a polynomial in n. That's not hard to prove. You look at the coefficients of that. And the result is that the coefficients form a log complex sequence. All right. Um, that's a corollary. Um, how do I prove that? And this will tell me later how to, I mean, this will, this will be a, a stepping stone on how to prove the grimbaum kalai sakaria conjecture later. Um, so, the idea goes back to McMullen, which actually, I mean, um, Imre is not no, 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 no longer visible, but I mean, until recently, Imre and uh, Peter McMullen, they used to be at the, at the same university. I don't know whether uh, Peter still shows up, but I mean, this is his idea. Um, sometimes he does. Yeah, sometimes he does. Thank you, Imre. Um, so, I have on this on this uh, on the on the cone of on the on this on this on this ring associated to a matroid, I can look at this um, um, I can look at the degree one component, and now I can look at um, the the cone of uh, or the, the subset of the of the degree one component um, whose coefficients are given by submodular functions, um, and this is um, this is what is called the Neff cone. And now what I can now what I can do with this NEFCO, well I can I can ask, well, I mean, okay, so this, this gives me a notion of convexity at least, right? So I'll notice that somehow here again there's there is no notion of convexity, but I have this, this mysterious cone of submodular function. And now how does it work? So it turns out that there are two steps to the to to, to proving this to proving the left shed theorem and the Hodgman relation. Um, and they kind of intertwine. It turns out that the Hodgman relations in co-dimension one, so for matroids of a lower rank, or for graphs, or for graphs of a of a of a lower rank, right, with a with a with a, a smaller, a strictly smaller spanning tree. Um, the um, that uh, the 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 the, the Hodgman relations imply the hart left theorem. All right, and then what is the second step? Well, the hart left shed theorem, then um, it turns out, uh, what, does it what, it, what does it mean to have the hart left shed theorem? Um, well, it means that um, if you have the hart left shed theorem already, then the signature can never degenerate. It can never, I mean, there can, no, can never be a flip, right? Because um, for the signature to change, right? Some of the, the hart riemann relations, they say something about the signature. And for the signature to change, it must be zero at some point by, by just interme intermediate value theorem. Right. Um, so um, what I have to do is okay. So I have to prove the Hodgman relations for one special case um, that I want, and then I have to kind of gradually deform for the Hodgman relations from the case I have um, to the to to the case I want, and prove that the 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 Hodge, that the um, and uh, because the hardlock that, uh, that is preserved along these moves, this will be this is given to me automatically by by this induction, and that's it. Um, that's the idea of McMullen. It's beautiful, and it gives like in, 
I mean, he did not. I mean, he did not see this uh, initially of as proving something more general than than the algebraic geom geometers knew how to prove or knew to prove. But this is really his method. So he originally just gave a new combinatorial proof of this Hartlepschet term in the case of toric variety. But I mean, that's really how, was, uh, how you should see it. It's something, you know, it's, a, it's a marvelous tool to, to, to do something more general. Um, now, what is the next step? All right, so now I have this, 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 this Hartlepschet theorem for this case of, of, of matroids, but there's still this notion of, of orientation, of positivity that's given to me in this case by the submodular functions. How would I how would I do this in the case of, of, of general spheres? It turns out that there, I have no chance of, of, of doing this again. Um, so there's no notion of positivity. Um, there's no notion of um, of, of, of convexity, of, of some modularity that I can use reasonably to prove this again. So what can I do? Well, I mean, so instead of asking for orientation of positivity or, or, um, or, or anything like that, or what I can do instead is I can, I can look at for derangements. I can look for general positions. So here's a statement. Um, so I take any simplicial homology sphere and actually, um, I mean, okay, so we, we don't actually need uh, the, 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 the PL here, but I mean, the, the, the proof I wanted to sketch uh, works for the PL case. So, I mean, there are different proofs of different general, generalities. Um, what I will do is um, I take um, um, a choice of, of, of sufficiently generic linear forms um and i i want to okay so now i i just have generic replacing my geometry okay and i have a generic element in degree one then i want to still have my isomorphism between degree i and degree t minus i um so how do i do that um well okay so that's 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 uh okay so there's no longer no positivity so i need something to replace my um my um uh my uh, my left shit, uh, my my Hodrina relations with it somehow inc inc encoded something about the signature right the signature we really don't have any longer there's no longer any signature so what i do is okay so i have to i replace this with something and what i replace this with is uh, what i call the Hollerman relations um this is um another uh, I mean, these are two combinatorials. I will, I will explain how their names enter in in a in a in a few minutes. But um, the idea is okay. So I have I no longer have signature. I no longer can say something about the signature on subspaces. So what I do instead, I look at the same Hodrima bilinear form. So this bilinear form that connects uh, the. Um, that connects the degree i with the degree i and gives me some number. And what I want to say is that this does not degenerate when I restrict to subspaces. So this quadratic form should not should never degenerate when looking at any at any um, at any subspace. So now this this here this this will be my replacement for positivity. So instead of having some sign, I just don't degenerate. So I, 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 I that's kind of, I mean, at, at first sight, it, it sounds like a very wild proposition to even look at it. We will see that this is somehow central. Um, and this is that this is related to a linear algebra version of whole marriage theorem on one hand and the the Laman rigidity theorem on the other hand, it's kind of, I mean, it will explain what this means. Hall marriage theorem probably many people know, the Laman rigidity theorem is something that is uh, maybe more, a little more obscure, but I will explain it. All right, so this is, this is my proposal and this in the end works. By now we have actually several proofs of this theorem in varying the, uh, uh, generality. So there's another proof of this theorem um, that uh, that uses some basically some basic uh, basic uh, 
tricks with transcendental using the fact that you know, we can we can immediately take transcendental coordinates if we look at generic coordinates. Um, but this somehow this property of, of not degenerating of this Poincaré pairing not degenerating at subspaces that is still the key to every to every proof. So um, what are some corollaries of this? So um, one corollary is um, well the grunbaum kalai sarkaria conjecture. That is a very nice corollary. Um, it um, it somehow the, this gives us somehow the, 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 the this, this embedding into spheres and balances somehow the complexity of of, of, of manifolds of, of complexes that embed into to, to, to spheres. But also more generally, actually, it, you can you can do the same thing with uh, complex implicit complexes embedding into um, into into more general manifolds. So you don't have to embed into spheres. You can embed into a torus and ask how many how many triangles can there be if I have bound the number of edges works in the same way. Another corollary that was kind of, that is, that is, is famous in this area is um, the, um, the, the so-called uh, the G conjecture, which said, okay, somehow the G conjecture, this was, this was McMullen's original conjecture and motivation to, to actually work in this subject. So what he said is, okay, so for simplicial polytops, there is a characterization of, or there should be characterization. First, you said is a conjecture, by now it is a theorem. There, should, there, there is a characterization of the face numbers of these of, of, of polytops in terms of algebraic invariance. So give me, give me some vector of integer, of positive integers, I can tell you whether this is um, the, or the, whether this is a face vector of a polytop in an efficient way. All right, that's, that's one, this is the original motivation. And then of course you can ask, well, does this characterization extend to spheres? All right, so we have a triangulated sphere. Does this give me more face vectors? All right, so if I have a face vector of a sphere, can this be more general than the face vector of a polytope? I and mean, the surprising thing is that it can't. So one of the corollaries of the Zepschitz theorem is that, well, there's really no, there's no, no there's no, no face number, so no, no number of vertices, edges, and so on, that is more general than your variety C, the polytop. That's a cool corollary. And then there is also other, I mean, you can do many other things. So the first corollary where I write on the top here is, well, I mean, you can ask how many vertices a triangulation has to have, and it turns out to be related directly to the to the to the betting numbers of the manifold. So if you have a manifold with large betting numbers, then I mean it, it, it's intuitively clear that you need many vertices. But uh, proving that is rather tricky. And one of the ways to prove this, um, and so far, I mean this is the only way to prove this, is using the Lefschetz theorem. Um, I should notice that, um, um, however, that this that this. Uh, this notion of Hallermann relations is rather transversal. It's, 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 it's very different from the classical smoothness and Kähler notions. So for instance, I mean, so for, if there is an algebraic geometry in the audience, I, in this format actually, I don't see anyone in the audience. So I don't know who's listening. But for instance, P1 to the N, right? Some other, the, 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 just uh, the, the, the power of projective space um, does, which is a very nice and smooth variety. I mean, you cannot get, I mean, you almost cannot get nicer than that other than taking projective space itself. It does not satisfy the whole Lamont relations. And um, I wanted to explain this in more detail, but I will, I will skip it. Um, and instead, I will, I will immediately go to the proof. I, I will, so, uh, this is again, my, uh, my tablet not working. So how do I prove how do I prove the, this, the, the, the Lefschetz property? What, what is even, I mean, what is a, I mean, let me at least give you a glimpse and I will give you the glimpse of the original proof because it, it justifies this name of, of, of looking, of calling it whole, um, of calling it whole, a version of whole marriage theorem and um, a version of this Laman rigidity theorem. And I mean, the whole marriage theorem is really small. That's, that's a, kind of a beautiful connection. So how do I con construct this isomorphism really? Right? So that's what I want to say. Um, 
And here's a beautiful, a beautiful lemma. So essentially, I mean, I, I did not know when I when I proved this lemma or when I needed this lemma um, that this is essentially a lemma due to Kronecker. Um, so let me let me explain my perspective before I explain uh, more the before I before I go into the the relevance of this theorem. So. Um, when you prove, I mean, okay, so when you prove whole marriage theorem, so what, it was, let me remind you, whole marriage theorem, it says, so you have to, you have a family, you have some you have some boys that you have a num some number of girls, and then you have a relation between them that is expanding. So this is somehow the, the acceptable partner relation. Right? So given um, a number of, um, um, given a number of, um, um, hmm. Given the number of boys, the acceptable partners on the level on the side of the girls should be at least as large as uh, the, the 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 set of boys that you picked. And by I mean, you don't have to make this uh, this symmetric. It is automatically as it turns out symmetric. If if that is true, then you, there is a way to marry them off, to partner them off in a stable way, so that each of them gets acceptable partners. I mean, there's a slight cheat here in the sense that. I mean, it assumes that acceptable partners is symmetric, which is kind of an idealized version of real life, but uh, fine, let's, let's not go there. Um, okay, and so how do I, I mean, how do I prove this? Well, one way to naively approach this would be, well, I mean, okay, so I, I, I marry them off one by one, and then in first order, I try to just, uh, I mean, if I, I get a new, if I look at uh, the next boy, I want to, I just look at the girls uh, that are available. That would be the first order way of doing this. And this lemma is actually the small, the linear algebra version of this, you know, this, this, this idea. So if you think about it, what I, because I have two linear maps, all right, um, A and B. And remember, in the end, I want to have this matching. I want to have this isomorphism between boys and girls. Or in my case, I want to have the, Isomorphism between degree i and degree d minus i. And so what I what I then do? Okay, so well I take just well I would, would just take any map and I want to take its kernel. I want to make its kernel as small as possible. So what I do is I have my my my, my ways of marrying the boys already. That's a, and then my new approach of marrying the boys is b. All right, and I want to combine them. And the smallest kernel I can hope for in the generic linear combination is well the intersection of the individual kernels. And here's a, I mean, here's a way of 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 of, of satisfying this. All right, so I have uh, I, I take the kernel of A and I map it under B and I intersect it with the image of A. And this should be zero, right, in the target space. If this is the case, then indeed. Um, my my I, I I can I can I have this I have this the smallest possible kernel, all right? So what do I do now? All right, I have my sphere, and I multiply one by one. I multiply one by one with the vertices, all right? I mean with one by one with the variables with individual variables, and I want the kernel to be smaller and smaller. So my, my, my ideal goal in the end is that the kernel of the generic linear combination is just the intersection of the individual kernels of these maps, right? And then it turns out by Poincaré duality, if this is small, if you have this property for all the vertices together, well then by Poincaré duality, it turns out that the intersection of these kernels is, is, is just zero, which means that the map is injective, which is my desired isomorphism. So, let me let me um, let me before I mean I already gave the the, the motivation a little so the, so I, I basically explained it while I was explaining the conic dilemma. Um, but uh, let me let me before let me let me not let me not go to the motivation of the Laman yet but let me just explain why this okay so it, I mean it sounds as if this is like a an arbitrary criterion, right? I mean, why would this have any relevance in 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 this in this case? Well, the point is, um, well, I could take the I can if I if I think about it, the kernel of A and the image of A in the in this kind of Poincaré duality algebra, they naturally form orthogonal complements, right? So now I pull back, I take the I, I, I 
I multiply with B. Okay, so now they live essentially in the both in the both in the image. I can intersect all of everything with the image of A. Sorry, in, can they, can they intersect everything with the image of B, right? If they intersect, they must intersect with the image of B. All right, and now the point is that in the image of B, I am looking at two orthogonal complements. When do orthogonal complements intersect trivially? Well, this is the case in a Poincare duality algebra if and only if the pairing does not degenerate when I restrict to one of the factors, right? If I restrict to the image of A or I restrict to the kernel of A, um, then the, this map should not degenerate. Um, so um, this explains, okay, so this explains why this, it's now this, um, this linear algebra, this, this kind of this non-degeneracy at subspaces condition that I looked at in the whole Laman relation, that this is really the right way to, to, to propose this, uh, to, to, to formulate this expanding condition that we have um, in, the, in, the, in the finite, in the, in, the, in the combinatorial case of the whole Laman relations, because this will give me, this will give me the possibility to, in each case, to just marry off the boys in first, in first order. And that's it. Um, and this is- Karel, the, Karel, yes? your time is almost up. Ah, okay, okay. So, no time left for questions if you, we have had, I think, two, two more minutes or three more minutes from- the Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, okay, okay. Um, let me, okay, so let me just uh, skip that. Um, and there's another, okay, so I explained to you how to get from the Hallerman relations to, um, um, to I, from the Hallerman relations, I explained to you how to get to, to the to the Zepschatz property. Let me not go and explain the other direction because I mean, it's a little more technical, it needs a little more geometric topology. Um, let me just close by saying um, that um, if you want like the, um, the, the 12 hour version of what I just talked about. Um, I recently gave the uh, Adama lectures at EICS about this topic. Um, I mean, you can always read the paper, but then you can just also watch the YouTube videos of that. And let me just close with that. Um, if, and thank you for your attention. Uh, um, this actually already happened. So. <laughs>